for the interruption, we had some technical issues, which can happen, as you know. I'm going to introduce panelists again. I was introducing Anna Frankie, who is the president of CONICET, the second female president of the organization. And she's also the president of the Argentine Network of Gender Science and Technology. She is a doctor in chemistry and biology and has over 160 different publications in national and international scientific magazines and reviews. We also have with us Carol Mandel, who is chief advisor, chief scientific advisor at the FCDO and uh, an expert in science, scientific diplomacy. She has been in Argentina a few times and always uh, maintains close contacts and relationship with the embassy and our country. She's an astrophysics physicist from the University of Bath and is a member of different advisory boards and communities and a great contributor to the role of women in science. We also have with us Marta Cohen, who is a dear friend of our embassy, of our embassy apologies, and she has been distinguished with an MBE because of her work. She's also an expert in pediatric um, pathology and is the director of the uh, pathology department and director of um, genetic, genetics and pathology at the uh, pediatric uh, hospital. We also have with us Carolina Orquera, who is a cybersecurity expert from Argentina and works both with public and private entities and is now um, senior leader at Inmarsat, which is the Argentine body that deals with cybersecurity. So I don't want to bore you and keep you for longer. Uh, just simply to add that as um, a male individual, I wish that we should never have to celebrate a Women's Day uh, ever again, simply because I wish that there were no reason for us to do this. In our case, in Argentina, as well as I know it is in the UK, gender politics is a priority in each of our country's agendas. We know that this is um, that this is important for both our countries as well as the international agenda as well. So it's not only what we do abroad and in the international arena, but also what we do within our own borders. We are very proud to have created the Ministry for Women, Gender and Diversity in our country and a special um, cabinet for the transversalization of gender politics in our country. I think that sometimes we are privileged to be witnesses of change when we get to a witness and live through different changes in um, our societies and the structures under which we live. But as any revolution, there's always an avant-garde, but there's always a need for um, mass support and consensus. And I think that that is what's going on in the world these days, that women are, um, stepping forward and they are improving their status everywhere. And this is not just to the benefit of women, but to the benefit of all humankind. As a man myself, I had to say, 
that it's not just an ethical and moral imperative that we bridge the gap, but also a developmental and economical one, because I think that uh, human resources, human beings are the most precious resource that humankind has, and we had to make the most of them, both men and women alike. And it's just not a um, matter of quantity, but also it is a matter of quality. I mean, how women are perceived, how women's contribution to all the different facets of human experiences is equally important and they have to be renewed and reassessed and revalued as well. So, because it is women with their contribution that keep pushing history and humankind forward. So that's all I want to say. I'm going to now give the floor to Alessandra who's going to moderate our debate. So thank you very much and welcome everyone. I hope you all enjoy our session. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Ambassador, and let's <laughs> dive straight in because I know that we lost a few minutes with our technical difficulties. I just want to remind the audience that you are surely seeing a world icon on your Zoom menu, and that is where you can select the language you wish to listen to today. So we are going to now kick off our panel. We will listen to Dr. Anna Franke first, then we will listen to Professor Mandel afterwards, um, Ms. Orqueda, and finally, Dr. Cohen will um, share some final remarks. And after that, we'll have a Q&A, a very short Q&A. We kindly ask that you do not write your questions in the chat section in our Zoom screen, but in the Q&A uh, box. And happy Women's Day to all of you. Well, good morning for us in Argentina. Good afternoon to you over there. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's actually an honor for me to be part of this panel with such distinguished colleagues. I just wanted to share with you a little bit about the situation of women in science in Argentina. But if we look at the data that we have from last year, uh, data that comes from Scopus, is actually uh, a very good outlook that we have in our country. Because in Argentina, 51% of those quoted in scientific publications are women. Now, compared to some more central countries who are in the 37, 33%, Japan is around the 7%, then one would be able to infer that women are in a very good position in our country. If we also look at the amount of women researchers in CONICET, we know that 55% of our researchers are women and 65% of our interns are women as well. So you would see this is a remarkable situation that we have in our country. But we also see the same trend in student enrollment in our universities, which is on average about 60%. So one might very well start wondering what the problem is. Well, the problem is, and it becomes evident when we look into it more thoroughly, because a scientific career has five different stages in our country, such as a uh, uh, junior researcher and senior researchers and lead researchers. And what happens in Argentina, as in many other parts of the world, is that these many women in science are always in the lower stages of the career progression in science. And if we get to, for example, the uh, stage before last, there are only four women. There's a 4% of women in senior positions and only 23 to 30% of them 
in the middle stages are women. So the same happens if we compare it to academia, to professorships and tenures. So the percentage of women in those uh, senior leading positions is also lower. So such a widespread presence of women in science in our country is actually in the lowest levels of career progression in science. So last year, when the proposal for um, career advancement and proportion in our country were put forward, we started wondering what we could do to foster the role of women, because it's not just that women are not admitted to these higher scala phones. What we also notice is that women are not even applying to those positions. So there's something in the life of women that also is halting them and keeping them from ambitioning access to the higher stages of career development. So we've been analyzing the progression of the career of both men and women at different age groups and different moments in their lives. And we need to understand how these different career progressions, career development policies and possibilities and access to leading positions affect men and women. We also have to understand geographical differences within our country because we know it's not the same to be living and working in Buenos Aires than in the north, the south or the west of our country. So we need to have a different um, view of the situation in our country, have a clearer understanding, a better mapping of the situation to understand what is going on, who is accessing what, and who is actually applying to different positions. We also ask ourselves, is this the same in science than in any other sectors? And within science, is this the situation in all different careers or areas of expertise? Well, we also notice that this trend is very much present in engineering and technology related fields. We see that there are only 19% of students of engineering who are women and that there's a one female engineer every 10,000 inhabitants where there's one engineer or, or a, for every 3,000 inhabitants that graduates from university. And we see that in science, women also opt for those options that had to do more with life science or the environment, anything that has more nurturing, whereas they tend to avoid the more technical materials related courses. And only 15% of all those workers in the IT sector, for example, are women in our country, which also highlights the trends that I've been mentioning. And it also highlights how, um, how strict and how difficult competing in these areas is for women. Many of these university courses related to computing sciences that started in the 1960s and 70s in our countries, where I'm talking back to when computers were made of punched cards. And back then there were a lot more women working in computing sciences. And now computing sciences have progressed but women have not progressed with it because there are a lot less women in computing sciences now than before. We have about 60% of all student body that are made of women, but there are only 12% of women that graduate and a much lesser percentage that keep on working in their chosen professions. So, 
senior positions are more difficult to get to by women. We have only 5% of all research organizations and bodies within our CONICET that are led by women. We have very few that are working in sciences, uh, a few selected few that are working with women and others that are representing different provinces and region. And the advisory board now has only two women among its members. And the highest number that we had ever had in our history of the advisory board was three women at the same time. So there are very few women in leading position and also decision-making roles in these key organizations, which not only means that there is no voice of women represent, being represented in these bodies, but also that there are very few leading role models for future generations. It wasn't that long ago that we um, managed maternity leave for grant holders. And thanks to uh, Dr. Adora Barranco, a famous feminist who actually achieved maternity leave and the extension of the grant of the bursary uh, through government permit. This was uh, very fair, the certain uh, Researchers didn't um, welcome the idea. Another problem is uh, the matter of uh, uh, care for dependents. So we're actually now trying to resolve access to certain services which are not very well distributed in the country. But this year, we started to uh, organize a crash in Puerto Mari, which would take into account all the institutions within the area. And our advisory board has actually added female male grant holders who have dependents who are children under three. And we uh, give them a bursary as well, an allowance for, for nurseries, uh, for childcare. So, this situation begins us to build to resolve the matter of childcare. Generally speaking, we don't usually hear about uh, harassment and gender violence in our subject matter. Since 2017, at Conicet, we have a gender violence watch or a unit which deals with the legal department and human resources department. Last year, despite the COVID situation being complicated, but we actually opened four offices uh, in Rosario, Puerto Mañi, La Plata, Córdoba. And the idea will be there where we have a scientific technological center, then you can actually have a system of reporting abuse or harassment or a, a matter of discrimination. And this is what we've been doing as an initiative within some of the um, inland regions of the countries. And there is uh, the Micaela Act, who was a very young militant lady who was uh, murdered. And I think from 2018 onwards, this act was enacted that uh, forces everyone within the state to go through some training when we're talking about gender violence. And that was done at uh, institutional level at CONICET at the level of management as well. And we will do in so, so this year everywhere else. So we have training in the matter. We have tried to improve all protocols and regulations concerning gender. Uh, equal access, equal participation, when we're talking about tender processes or uh, employment, employment um, tenderings and access to becoming a researcher, to allowances, to bursaries. So last October, 
we created a general network of gender and diversity with uh, help and with the participations of all manner of staff, including admin staff, to highlight all the different uh, demands that come to us. And we cover the whole country. Coliset has almost 30,000 employees. So we need to promote transformation and diversity, but also looking inward to see institutionally what happens when a man or a woman request a job promotion. What are the criteria that we need to evaluate for this? And last year, we examined a few complex and convoluted situations. We have huge demand for this. Since the 95, I am part of the technology, technology network and the reply from all our workers, uh, they said, well, are we, are we dealing with the gender matter? And I know that we have progressed a lot concerning these movements. And this is actually, as Dr. Abarranco says, has made women aware this is not a personal matter, but it is a system that doesn't naturally promote us. So we need to demand, but we need to come together and we need to explain in order to progress uh, with the situation of gender equality for all, don't get me wrong. So um, I hope that in 10 or uh, five years even, we're not talking about these topics because there would be a result. From Conicet, we are willing to keep on promoting the situation and to improve the situation because we're talking about meritocracy. Meritocracy is valid when the opportunities are the same. And as of today, I don't think the opportunities are the same, neither in the academic sector nor in the rest of the world. So this is what we're celebrating today's day and promoting and supporting women in order to improve the situation for all. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Frankie. That was a very, very interesting intervention. I now give the floor to Dr. Mandel, Professor Mandel, I beg your pardon. Please go ahead. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to join you this afternoon and particularly to connect with such eminent women colleagues. And also thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your very progressive words. And thank you to our male allies who help us to change the world. And I think today is particularly important to help us to see the brilliant women that we have in our communities and in our departments and in our sectors. Um, our women are doing incredible science internationally. We're connecting together, we're collaborating, we're driving forward solutions for the global pandemic. Um, we've driven you know, the discovery of vaccines which are opening up the world. And so I think the impact and contribution of eminent women around our science systems internationally can't be overstated. But we often don't see our women. And I think that's what today for me is about, is about the visibility, the recognition, and the thanks that we give to our women who do this against many of the disadvantages that Dr. Frankie has actually outlined very eloquently to us today. I think what struck me about uh, the comments that you, you made in your, your presentation there, particularly the importance of data, and bringing the evidence to the fore. And actually the numbers that you quote are not dissimilar to the UK. Um, from my field of physics, this is a traditionally white male dominated field. I have often been the lone woman in the room at many times in my career. And I became head of my physics department at the University of Bath before I joined government. And I also then chaired a forum nationally for the Institute of Physics that brought together all heads of physics uh, from around the country. And I think I was maybe one or two heads of physics in the country. And we all came together and we talked about the um, stubborn statistics in our field. So the Institute of Physics did a very deep piece of work and they found that we have not had more than 20% of women coming in as undergraduates. Um, we haven't moved that dial in over 20 years, despite a number of gender um, 
uh, gender-based kind of initiatives that we've led. And so we wanted to look much more deeply and see what is causing this um, inability to fill the pipeline to start with, but also in fields like the biological and the life sciences, where the, the pipe may be filled with many women at the beginning, but we, what we call the leaky pipe, or in my personal opinion, it's a hemorrhaging pipe. Um, so we're losing these women and we lose these senior role models. So I think, first of all, to say what the reason that this panel today is so exciting for me is as a lone senior woman, it's incredibly important for me to connect across other fields, if you are the only woman in your field at your senior level, to reach out across different disciplines and make those networks connect is also really important because we tackle many of the same biases, the same structural inequalities and the same power structures that have been there probably for, for thousands of years. And so really to connect across our fields is important because as senior women, we need that support so that we can then help change the systems that we have come through despite the inequalities and the barriers that we faced. The Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK have published two really important uh, publications. One is called um, Breaking the Barriers. This is about the sorts of practical steps that can be taken to help uh, against gender-based violence and particularly sexual harassment and gender-based bullying within the science um, field. And it's a really, really valuable um, report. I can share some links afterwards if you'd like to share that with viewers. And also some really on online tools to help people to think in their own way about what unconscious bias is and how that impacts all of the decisions that we make and how that diminishes our ability for our systems to be the best they possibly can. The second report that they published is called Gender Bias in Publishing. And this really goes to the heart of what Anna was saying about how we measure excellence, how we reward and recognize excellence. And that um, is, was a really important report that actually showed across all of the Royal Society chemistry, of Chemistry publications, and they publish many internationally that gender bias is real. And again, very influential because the evidence is there. One can take the evidence, one can lay it on the table of a policymaker or a university rector or a fellow colleague who may not actually believe that gender bias is real. And what's been very clear to me is that inequality is pervasive and persistent in science. So let's just say what it is and then let's start to put solutions in place to tackle this. I think we've moved far beyond having the discussion as to whether gender bias actually exists. And of course, there are many ways that that manifests. I mean, it's great to hear Anna describing um, some of the initiatives for, um, for mothers coming back to the workplace. We've had some of those in the UK helping women particularly return to the workforce to have mentors to be able to move back into research because we know that when we step off the treadmill of research, we very quickly appear to lose our edge but also to change workplace practices for parents in general, because obviously the things that disadvantage mothers differently disadvantage fathers. And actually when fathers are expected to pursue a kind of career where they are ever present in the workplace, that they're rewarded for being ambitious or aggressive um, or actually not having a good work-life balance, we all also know that that disproportionately impacts um, their, 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 their partners. And so actually fixing the whole system is really important. This is something that we put at the heart um, of our government policies and in particular working through our research councils because obviously how we how we put money into the system is also a very powerful lever and understanding those biases that stop women coming forward to apply for funding or actually even being biased against women whose applications are on the table. You can see a number of research studies um, that show that when you actually have a female na name as a PI um, that actually there's already unconscious bias within the room against that that, that proposal. We've also seen evidence that men are promoted on potential, women are promoted on achievement. So we have an awful lot of different granular levels at which we have to tackle these biases. And I think in terms of encouraging young women and girls to come into science, again, we have much work to do in terms of tackling the stereotypes. Um, we often speak to parents when I was a, at my head of my physics department, we would have recruitment events. And it was very clear that having a woman head of physics really changed the perception of the parents who came to visit, who were already thinking that their children wanted to study physics, but it gave a different tone in the room that actually there was some diversity. And in fact, the, the, the ongoing stereotype of what a male a physicist looks like is usually an older white man, often Einstein. And again, this really tells us about some of the deeply held cultural stereotypes that we have in science, that science is done by a lone, usually white male genius. Um, this is how, for example, our Nobel Prizes appear to, to reward um, achievement. And we know that this is wrong. We know that science is done by diverse teams and the best science is done by the most diverse teams. So actually celebrating that diversity 
appreciating the work that our technicians do, without whom we could not have tackled this global pandemic, our professional services within our universities that support and enable our scientists to do their best work, good managers, making sure that management practices are appropriate and that we're tackling all of these hidden biases are all parts of that ecosystem. And then within the UK, we have had a number of um, national initiatives. One that stands out is called Athena Swan. This was actually put in place by um, some very eminent women scientists, um, for example, Dame Sally Davis, who became our chief medical officer um, and is now our global um, antimicrobial resistance envoy and also the um, president of Trinity College, Cambridge. And she, with a couple of other very senior eminent women, particularly Professor Dame Jocelyn Bell and a couple of others, decided that they wanted to make a real difference in our academic sector. They were not seeing the change that they had expected should happen naturally throughout their career. And what they did was they connected the funding to real diversity change within universities. And they made sure that data were put at the heart of this. And I've sat on a number of University of Athena Swan committees. And it's really important that actually you do look at your organizations and say, do we have the systems in place to be able to gather the human resources data to understand how our women progress or fail to progress through our systems. And when you get the data and you put the data on the paper and you sit down and you analyze the data in the way that all good scientists should be able to do, suddenly you start to see where the barriers are in your systems. And in fact, organizations are rewarded if they are able to gather these data and write an honest description of the status of their organization. They're then able to get onto the Athena Swan Award Ladder. A bronze award will be awarded if an organization is very honest about the position that it finds itself in, and it has a very clear action plan as to how to address those inequalities that the data show. And then there are higher level awards, silver, gold, and there's now a new award um, that, that's that's being discussed above that to actually reward organizations that really make a fundamentally um, big change to the way that their systems are set up and to remove some of those traditional structural barriers um, that women are having to navigate or, or, or push against. And then, of course, one has to maintain one's standards. So you can't just do this as a one-off, win a medal, and then go back to, to biased structures and systems. You have to show that you maintain that. And in some cases, that have been connected uh, to the award of funding. Without a minimum award, you're not allowed to apply for the funding. And so that was a really strong piece um, to drive the, the sector to really look at itself, not to assume that everything was fine and to always have the women be the voices having to lift up and say, actually, there's a problem here. And this is also important that everybody owns the, the problem and also owns the solution, because what many of us on this panel will also have experienced, when you are the lone woman in the room, you also end up doing a disproportionate amount of the professional care work. And so whether you have an equality at home within your family and you're sharing your, your home care duties, when you come into the workplace, what we see is it's often the women who are lifting the load disproportionately on sitting on committees. If their organization suddenly says, we need to have some diversity, let's find a woman and we have no women, we'll use that one woman on every committee. And that's actually not real, um, real gender equality either, because of course that woman then takes on a disproportionate load of the management of the professional care work, um, just to, to tick the box of diversity. And so it's really changing attitudes, it's changing systems and structures. And we know that poor processes um, disproportionately disadvantage women and minorities. So it's fixing all of those systems and ultimately putting the values at the heart of our organization because science really is a very human thing. And I think just to finish what I would also really like to say, I've always worked internationally and that's one of the, the really wonderful things about science. So I wouldn't like to end this talk and say it's all terrible and it's all awful and actually this is not the field to come into. And particularly during this pandemic, the one thing that I found incredibly inspiring is the power of science to change the world, the power of science to lift us and move us on, the magnitude of the global challenges we face global climate change, global health, these are not small, small problems and they cannot be tackled by one nation, they cannot be tackled by a monoculture, and men alone can't tackle it, and a particular kind of man can't tackle it. We do need to connect internationally. And for me, what's kept me inspired through this very difficult year, and I know we all you know, will suffer these, these challenges personally in very different ways, has been connecting with wonderful scientific colleagues around the world, and particularly eminent women, but also the younger women who are shouting for change, who are holding the older generation to account and are giving me the courage to continue to push the boundaries and say we need to fix these systems because there's too much at stake for everybody. So thank you very much for the opportunity to connect this afternoon and I'm hoping we'll be able to make real progress and continue to collaborate between Argentina and the UK. Thank you.
Thank you very much. It was a very inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Carolina? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? I'm going to go for English. I'm a child of two worlds, and I think I, I, I express myself a little bit better in English. So, I mean, uh, a lot to take in, a lot to digest. Uh, extremely honored to be here. And um, again, I'm a fan, uh, I'm fond of numbers, as, as Professor um, Mundell uh, presented, and also as Dr. Franti presented. Um, the imbalance is overwhelming and you know we can see the echoes in other disciplines such as cybersecurity. Um, like many women, I tend to be the only woman in a room. I've been in video conference across the globe with nations of uh, three, four nations, and I'm one or two women out of 50 people attending. Um, so um, I don't think it's necessary for me to make a case for diversity. We all know that diversity in all its aspects, whether it be gender, race, it's, it's, it's for benefit to all of us because it represents the, the, the global population. Um, here are some numbers as well. So according to the International Information System Security uh, Certification Consortium, um, again, in cybersecurity, uh, of all the cybersecurity professionals, only 20% are women. Uh, and this is a great improvement. This is a, a like 2019 statistics. In 2013, that was only 11%. Um, so we're moving in the right direction. Um, I am particularly fond of representation. I do think like um, the, there is no uh, one solution fits all. Unfortunately, in this in this uh, in this fight, there is not a silver bullet. It's it's sort of an interdisciplinary approach. And again, we're dismantling a system historically. So we need support, like like Ambassador Figueroa said, it, you know, or male allies uh, are our biggest supporters. And I've been lucky enough in my career uh, to have male allies that have supported me uh, in my career. Uh, needless to say, I think, uh, you know, like cybersecurity, um, <laughs> So for cybersecurity to be effective is interdisciplinary approach. So you not only look, people often think of cybersecurity as um, we implement technical tools to protect us um, from hackers, such as like firewalls and things like that. And it's much more um, complex than that. You know, it's looking at people, processes, policies, um, and, and, you know, in the people's field, it's about education. So I think education is important and a lot of what, um, what we are trying to do, certainly, uh, as I've been part of in Marsat, is again having those difficult conversations. I'm also very honored to be part of the women network at in Marsat, but also of the Eden uh, network, which is the network about racial diversity. So, again, to challenge uh, um, unconscious bias, we start having those difficult conversations, um, and I think that's one of the key things about educating people. Um, ironically, you know, in the world, I was looking at data about um, digital use and use of the internet across the globe. And actually, this is one of the areas that is less, um, I said, there's a less of a gap in terms of men and women. And it, it's, um, it's ironic then that the women that actually work in cybersecurity are a very small fraction. Um, and, and we need to be represented because there are those policies that we are dictating. So things about jurisdiction and the legality, privacy, data protection and things at a global level or voices are not being heard. And the same can go for discussions that we're having about women's reproductive, reproductive rights, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, again, in my small way, it's wonderful to see, you know, what the things that are happening at Connie said, I think that's, that's amazing. And the things that, uh, Professor Mundell shared as well. In a small way here at Inmarsat, we, we reach out to girls. So we have days where we invite girls in STEM and we talk to them. And again, we got a panel. So I work with some astrophysicists as well. So we have a panel of women and we try to, in a small way, to show our representation and um, to show actually we are like you, you can be in more senior positions. It gets harder the, 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 the further up you go. Um, but I think the the statistics are encouraging. I think we're moving in the right direction and um, there's a lot more work to do. Um, again, uh, it's important, uh, what I would reiterate what uh, the ambassador say to have male support in this. Um, racism, for example, is not a black 
people's problem. It is a white people's problem. In the same way, you know, uh, misogyny, any discrimination and like gender discrimination is not a women's problem. So although we're working hard to sort it out, uh, male support is is essential. Um, so it, it's great to, to see these conversations taking place, and I'm confident that we're moving in the right direction. But certainly, there there's there's a lot more more to do on that field. Um, so honored to be part of this conversation. I know we're running a bit out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Caro. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Cohen, now you have the difficult task of closing this uh, such interesting panel. Please, thank you. Muchas gracias, Embajador Figueroa, Ministra Vitiano. Many thanks, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador, uh, Minister. And thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with all these scientists, these women scientists. As Dr. Dr. Frankie was saying, we need to aspire to better data. When we look back, we have moved along. Yes. My mother was, in fact, one of the first women in my little hometown in Argentina to be a doctor. It was so difficult in the 50s to go to university. She was the first pediatrician. And I think this is why I personally never understood that difference or never thought I cannot go into science because of my mum's example. But uh, with hindsight, if we're thinking about science, technology, engineering, careers, or even mathematics or physics, are difficult for women. We have moved along, we have advanced and progressed, but we really must improve. And it shouldn't be a demand, it should come naturally. Only 70% of women in the 70s uh, had access to such opportunities, and that went up to 23% in the 90s, but only up to 26% in the past few years. As Dr. Frankie was pointing out, yes, percentages have gone up, but the percentages are still too low. I was reading an interesting article this weekend that was uh, talking about a study made with nursery children and primary children. And they asked them, draw something to do with science. And all the subjects drew a man in science. And it would be an older person, uh, white hair, and with a coat, with a white coat. And who actually drew women had been the little girls. So, well, then I have to go back again or look back. We have advanced, but not so much. I'm an optimist, of course. I think we all are. And we have to think differently. For example, I work at Sheffield Children's Hospital. It's a totally inclusive work environment, I have to say. If we don't have it as a written policy, we must do so. This has to be institutionally uh, set. We need X percentage of ethnic minorities, women, all kinds of representations. So that would be the first thing. We need to adapt those structures. Education is key. Children's education. I was lucky enough to have a ma mother who was a strong minded and she was a scientist, uh, the only one in a family. But we're talking about generations of children that now are going to have better access to university. But inclusion is uh, important. Inclusion has to be for all, of course, boys and girls. The barriers have to go down. And it really shouldn't be such a struggle. It should come naturally. 
So this is a future, in my opinion. Education from nursery to primary through to secondary education must reflect so. Research is also very important. When women, when we become mothers, then we have to take maternity leave. For us, it's very difficult to go back, really. And particularly if we, th we do research, we're high flyers in research, how do we go back into a scientific research community? Well, maybe funding bodies should say a certain percentage of this research, uh, the, the PI, has to be a woman. And in this way, perhaps we would be favoring women going into more research. And as Carol was saying, the international contacts being so key, that's fantastic. And my mother, as a scientist, always advised, always go to international congresses, go to networking events, do so. And this is what I always do, and I think it's wonderful. And throughout the pandemic, a colleague of mine from London, who is a close friend, uh, because I'm in the UK, she is the one that actually planted the idea in my head. Um, she started uh, Women in Science WhatsApp group. Uh, Peru, South America, US, from India, 80 of us every day. We connect, we talk, we're all, we're all doctors, um, we deal in pathology, we're all, uh, and that has been key. This is what we have to work on for the future, how to take down barriers, how to reform structures to make them inclus inclusive, and how we um, use funding to increase women in research, and then how we do we educate from the grassroots level onwards and upwards. Thank you very much for the invitation and for allowing me to speak to you. Well, thank you very much, Marta. It's actually a pleasure to uh, hear your words. And before we move on to the questions from the audience, I wanted to perhaps give you the opportunity to go back to something that all of you mentioned. I know Dr. Franchi said that women do not always apply for leading positions and Professor Mandel talked of stereotypes. Dr. Cohen also touched on the importance of education. So. Do you think there is any way we can fight against these stereotypes that is turning you into the only woman in the room and that we don't have to wait the many years it would take for education to actually kick in and have its effect? So what we could do, what do you think? Anna, maybe you wish to go ahead? Well, as Dr. Cohen said, I think that we had to start from the very beginning with the young children, the toys we give them to play with. There's somebody from UNESCO Science and Technology Project that is working with Mexico City, Sao Paulo and Buenos Aires, and they're doing the research. And when you ask children up to third grade in primary school, what is their favorite subject? They say math. And after the third grade, they no longer mention math, especially little girls. And they tend to say, well, they like natural sciences, but not necessarily math. Math somehow becomes a boy's thing and not a girl's thing. So maybe we're preparing boys for math better than we do little girls? Is it something that has to do with our society, with the media, or also the way that girls are educated at school, but also at home, their families? For example, IT, anything related to computing sciences, which is a field where there are very few women. 
studying communi uh, computing sciences. And when you think of the stereotypical IT person, it's sort of a young weirdo, you know, a nerd that is always working with computing stuff. And that is a huge difference between the stereotype of young boys or a young men and the stereotype of young women. And when you think of a physicist, you think of Albert Einstein, you know, the gray hair and the white coat, an older man, older white man. So the lack of role models have scientists, uh, have women scientists go to schools, talk to pupils, tell them what they do, show them that there are actual women doing those jobs as well, that they don't have to perhaps wait until they have the opportunity of actually having a female scientist in their families or among their friends. So we can expose them to different role models and hopefully we will be able to start uh, dismantling all these stereotypes that are so deeply rooted in our society. Because not too many years ago, the consensus was that women were not suitable to be scientists. So we had to keep fighting against that. I, I, Carol, I don't know if you want to comment on could I? Yes. I mean, I think it's really important. There was there was one study I read in the UK and it said that children as young as six, both boys and girls, both equally agreed with the stereotype that boys were naturally clever and girls had to work hard. If you then combine that with certainly in, in our country, the, the, the language around science being hard and particularly physics and maths being hard, what that subconsciously communicates back to children, their teachers and their parents is that life's going to be tough for girls if they pick the physical sciences and maths. All of that is completely wrong, but it's very deeply ingrained. And I think Anna makes a brilliant comment about toys. There was a really interesting analysis that I saw, an analysis from the, the 60s and 70s all the way up to the present day about how toys have changed. So through in the 70s, they were apparently much more gender equal. Um, my mum, unlike uh, Marta's wonderful mother, my mum was unfortunate that she could not stay in the workplace. She was required to resign when she was expecting me as her first child. My father was a biomedical scientist and both my mother and my father encouraged me. Neither of them went to university, so I was the first child in my family to go to university. But within one generation, I am now a professor and chief scientist within the UK government. So it shows what's possible. And at no point did I ever know that physics and maths were difficult. And that was because mm. I had the family support, but I was in a mixed school. And when I became, um, when I was 16 and I went into my, my exams for 16 to 18, I was one of three girls in a class of 40. And all of a sudden I realized I was different. And that was when the, ma the, the message was coming back to me that this isn't for you. This is not a field that you're allowed or able to enter. And it was because of some brilliant women physics teachers at that point. And I looked and thought, well, they have, so why can't I? And so it's all the way along the pipeline. The role models are important, but also the education of everybody who means well. So the, the teacher who maybe tries to help the girls more in maths because they know they should have more girls going into maths and they give those girls that help. What those girls internalize is that they needed the help. And so there's ways to give support, there's ways to give help. But for me, what I find really exciting is how you can inspire and say, these are the big questions. So physics is, you know, as you say, is stereotypically white male in the lab. What I've seen at ground level though, is the confidence that the young men come into my labs with and they put their hands on the equipment. They know no more about that equipment than the young women do. So it's confidence over competence. And we've had to really at that detailed level mm. start to restructure how we educate, how we give the girls the equal access, how we help them in tutorials or in other groups to understand that actually everybody's creative. One of the things we did in Bath was we opened up what was called a makers club. 
we realise that the pressures are particularly on students when they're being assessed and they think they're going to be marked on their, their performance. So we opened up a lunch club and we said, you know, men, women, turn up, there's lots of bits of kit, you can start to play and be creative. And I think that then feeds into a lot of the stuff that Carolina has said about the cyber security side. It does have a very macho image. It is this stereotype of a technical nerd. It's not. It's about people. It's about processes. And you get to do the maths and physics and computing for free. If you do astrophysics, I'm thinking about black holes, I'm thinking about galaxies, I'm thinking about, you know, alien life on other planets. And you do the maths, the physics, the engineering, because it's a tool to get to something bigger. And that for me is we need to be talking about science. We've all spent this afternoon talking about being women in science. I would love to know what you will work on and have a conversation about your ideas. That's what I would like the follow up session to this be for this to be so that we can network across that and just, you know, move the dial. Yeah. Uh, Alice, I just wanted to add a little something, if I may. Um, I love what you say, Carol, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, and what Anna said about modelos and representation. That's so important. And Alice, going back to what you said about, like, what if we don't want to wait another generation for the for, for it to grow? And, you know, in my experience, um, I, I've been very blessed to have women that support women. And I pride myself in being a woman that support women. Uh, there's been tons uh, like of research studies, uh, quizzes and stuff that that show that actually there's one a, a funny one that I love to quote, which is um, there was a job advertised in a newspaper, um, and it was exactly the same role. Um, it was exactly the same role, but one offer let's call it 20k, and the other offer 60k, and uh, it, it was the, exactly the same role. And more women applied for the 20k. And men overwhelmingly arrive for the ATK because it has about like, how they see their own worthiness. And that fascinated me because it is our own bias that we need to challenge as well. And we need to educate. And I think part of that is having great male allies like uh, Javier, our ambassador, um, but also as well, like us as women to uplift each other and to say, yeah, no, go apply for that role. You know, I mean, I'm in the, in the process as well with my friends, like, support each other and say no you can do this job and 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 that uh, uh, and i think that perhaps if we continue with those kind of behaviors we don't have to wait another generation to get the, the children to go up without the bias that we grew up with um and like like carol as well i'm the first person to go to university in my family to actually graduate uh, my mom um my mom is from a poor background actually she didn't even finish primary school uh, my dad was a lorry driver. Um, in terms of representation, I'm from a tiny town that only Argentines, Argentines might be familiar with called Arrecifes, which is 176 kilometers from Buenos Aires, uh, which is a lot of, for Carol, who, who might not be familiar, there's a lot of cows and fields, and that's, that's it. Um, so I was one of the first women to go to a polytechnic school. And in the polytechnic school, it's only been open to women for three years prior to when I went. And I'm talking, I'm 38. So this is not like old generations, but I remember we had a classroom of like 35 uh, people and there were like three women. Um, so, you know, and again, and I love math and I love electromechanics and I love all things like wonderful. I also love quantum physics. So I love to like talk to Carol later like, as a hobby. Um, so, you know, for me, uh, I went the long way. I, I studied law actually for two years because I didn't think that sciences was, it was just not an option. I had no representation whatsoever to see women scientists, you know, all women that I knew in my hometown were teachers or, uh, you know, they, they were on anything but sciences. So I thought, okay, well, I could be a lawyer because I've seen other women lawyers or I could be perhaps, a, you know, an architect. There weren't even that many women doctors. So. Actually, my, my way into STEM was a, a lot longer and not a straight line, but it was because I, I rediscovered my passion for sciences later in life. Um, and I demystified that thing about, well, I can do this. I can, I can represent, you know, it sounds silly now, many years later, but at the time when I, when I was deciding a career in uni, it wasn't that obvious to me. So thank you, that's my two cents. <laughs> And could I just say, Carolina, I think it's really inspiring to hear you say what a diverse route you've had into STEM. I think we also have to break this stereotype that you have to go from school to university and into your field and stick within your subject matter. You know, that wonderful diverse path is what makes STEM even more powerful. And you have, you know, skills and talents that you brought from your legal training that is vital in STEM that someone who's just gone down a physics route isn't going to have. 
Yo quería agregar que qué importante que es y todos lo hemos mencionado y el hecho de que uno... Yes, we all mentioned it and we all brought it up and the common denominator here is that we all got help from other women. We have people, so uh, women that helped Caroline, as she was saying, women who helped and you know, women who helped Carol. So we all had this strong female influence that has been key to all of us. And, and what we have a program in Sheffield that also involves uh, Nigeria and South Africa and Bangladesh is that we are constantly talking to each other and supporting each other. So these sort of networks are key to us because as women, we are born to get to where we want to, not to where we're told we have to go. And the only way that we can get to that destination is with the support of our peers and our fellow women in the same journey. So a personal anecdote uh, that showed me that we had to speak our minds uh, and, and left me to understand that when we support each other, our voice is actually louder. So in 2014, the president of the Pediatric Pathology Society, the International Society, so like the top of the world person, told me that I was interested in a postgrad course and I received a phone call from the person that is a former director of the same course that told me that I was accruing too much power and therefore I would not have going to have access to what I wanted. And what I was facing, I realized then was prejudice. And instead of saying, you're right and just leave it there and don't do anything, I understood that I had to speak up, that I had to uh, get support from other women so that uh, we are all able to say, no, this is not right. This is not what I deserve. I deserve the opposite and I'm going to go for it. And it's the network that's going to let us to do that. Well, thank you very much, Marta. And I have millions of questions to ask to all of you, but I want to go to the questions by the audience. And we have a question by Silvia Bralavsky, who's saying that a very serious issue in Argentina, or maybe not only in Argentina, is how difficult the personal relationships in management and direction are, which are in a way even cannibalistic, if you want, because women are not always um, interested in being so pushy in a way or so hard in our approach? Do we have to be as hard as men in our approach? No, I think that we can work differently. And what we need to do actually is not to change the approach, but the structure itself. Uh, these sort of macho, um, uh, chauvinistic, macho personality type alpha male that is dominating all these structures has to be also dismantled. We have to understand that we are all equals and inclusivity has to do with including everyone, women and men and women alike. And this has to happen in academia, the universities, in also the private sector. And there has to be also a deterrent and there has to be a check and balance system and the possibility of penalizing those who deviate. I agree with Marta. And I think that what we have to do is dare, go for it and do it, but also change management structures. And what happened, for example, in Latin America and the arrival of women to medicine um, one of the consequences of women, uh, female doctors now working, for example, in ER resulted in better shift for doctors who are on call. So this system that was also detrimental to men was modified only because of the presence of women. So our presence also benefits the men 
in our environments. So we have to change the conditions that limit access, but also we have to work on changing the structures themselves once we get there. And we need to support each other and we need to strengthen our support networks. Because for example, if I have an issue and I uh, talk to a colleague of mine and I receive support of a colleague uh, by this colleague to deal with the matter at hand, then we are strengthening that collaboration and that is key. Carol, would you like to contribute something? Yeah, I mean, I think Marta's comment about power is really important and dismantling that. I see very hierarchical structures and how we reward and recognize excellence um, is also a conversation that, that we have to have, that it can't just be in one particular style. Um, I think actually finding the power structure can be quite hard, particularly if organizations have maybe tried to take a surface approach to equality and diversity. So we see token women attached in different places or we see junior women um, put into senior positions but not empowered to actually have uh, the influence to really make a change and so i think stripping some of that back seeing where the power sits in the organization then understanding the people behind those the power politics is important um, but i think also you know as anna said it's behaviors and um, what we see is that at a time of crisis um, the the stereotypical alpha male leader who wants to grab the power is actually ill-equipped to deal with a, a complex crisis and i think we see this in many of our organizations in the current pandemic, um, that actually those leaders who've traditionally been the ones who have either taken the power or been given the power or floated into that power position because of the privilege structures are now under great strain and are not coping. And I think this really is the time to transform those structures and say we need those diverse teams because at times of pressure and complexity, particularly um, urgent pressure, I mean, Marta, you're in the medical profession, you know you have lives in your hands, then we can't have that single mindset because that's where mistakes happen. So it's been in industries like the airline industry and the medical profession that going back and learning from past mistakes and understanding where the failures have happened in processes and policies and systems under pressure that I think have started to bring the real change. And we haven't yet seen that translate through to much of our academic sector. We're seeing some of it in business, um, but I think you're right that actually that aggressive push everybody out of the way to get the prize is, is, is quite an outmoded um, approach now and we're starting to see that change. We need to keep accelerating that change. Thank you. Carolina, would you like to say something about it? Thank you, Alex. Uh, just imagine, well, um, I, I think that uh, dismantling the power structures and understanding them is essential. Um, I love what Marta said, uh, Dr. Cohen said about, um, and I think it's been repeated at, like throughout, but about data and setting targets. Um, we said, it, I think data is essential. So at Immersive, we're doing it with the diversity network. Um, if you cannot measure the problem, uh, you cannot address it properly. If you do understand where the disparity is, um, uh, then you can set a plan, you can put a plan in place to address it. Um, and I think data is important. And we do have, we're, we're gathering more data um, and it's, it's now how we use that data. But I think uh, as Dr. Cohen said, setting targets is important because it's not gonna happen on its own. Uh, women are not just gonna magically appear in more senior positions. We are gonna have to make it happen and hold the people important accountable. Um, also on the other side of the con, we work in organizations. Those organizations serve society. Um, society has a different mix. No, no matter where you work, you serve society. Um, and that society is diverse. So the organization has to represent the society you serve. Um, and if it isn't, you're not serving the society in, in the way that you should. Uh, and that, as I said, is not going to happen by accident. So data is super important. Setting targets, setting targets, uh, ambitious targets. Why not? About we want, uh, you know, a X percentage of women in the board. And, you know, it, data will help you set your baseline, know where you are to see where you what's realistic to achieve. But we are in conversations about you know, um, getting the right CVs into organizations very pragmatically to say, well, why are not, you know, well, we, we choosing, I, I hate when people say, I'm very passionate about this, but when people say, oh, well, we're not getting, we're not getting the right candidates. No, because you're not going to find them. If you go to recruitment agents and say, well, if you don't, I want, 
you know, I want to recruit more women to send me, don't send me 20 male CVs, send me 20 women CVs. And then we talk about it. It's like, we are the customers. We're paying money to recruiters, to recruit certain people. So um, let's use that leverage. Let's use our relationships to change, to tip the balance in, in our favor, to, to actually, you know, pragmatically uh, change the structures and the systems, um, you know, uh, in a way that they actually represent the people that we serve. Thank you. We have two more questions. I don't know if you have time. I'm sorry. Me estoy escuchando a mí misma. I was just. Una de las preguntas. One of the questions. Si hay un número, si hay estadísticas. Ask whether there are any statistics. Y salen a las ciencias of la trayectoria universitaria. University students that uh, start their studies in hard sciences, but then graduate as um, specialists in softer sciences. So how many people enroll? No, but we want to know if there if there's any statistic information that reflects a change in majors so people moving from hard sciences to softer sciences is that the case in the uk do you have information about this kind of uh, trend so i don't have the numbers to hand but i know we have quite a diverse set of courses across our academic sectors um, and you know broader interdisciplinary subjects like natural sciences um, do disproportionately attract women similar to the life sciences and so there's a there is a pipeline effect there um, we tend to worry more in the physical sciences engineering about the intake and also the dropout rate um, so we tend to see students just dropping their courses if they don't find it a welcoming environment for them. Um, and that's of real concern to universities because obviously we've already recruited them into those courses, which means they're, they're good enough, they have the talent, they have the interest and they have the qualifications to be there. And it's clear that we've not been able to support them in their studies for whatever reason to make sure that they go through. I think there's also a real change that I've seen in talking to senior women academic colleagues in engineering again, around what engineering means. So there still is, you know, a lingering misconception that, for example, mechanical engineering is about engines and about oil and about widgets, um, when actually, you know, biomechanical engineering can be, you know, you know very transformative. Um, it can be about the cyclical, cyclical economy, it can be about climate change, and it's about enabling our students to come through that system and think in new ways. So we need lecturers, we need professors um, also to be very diverse, not just in terms of gender and lived experience, but also the way they look at those subjects and they frame them and they move them out, certainly in the UK, from that post-industrial revolution kind of, you know, stereotype of what engineering is and, and what physic, physical science is. Are. And I think, you know, certainly the colleagues that I know who are working in that space have much more diverse student cohorts, their students learn much more, and they go out and do very, very diverse jobs and are very fulfilled in what they do. You know, we, I have a colleague who has two, two students, ex-students who may go on to become astronauts, you know, which is hugely exciting. And so I think we can see that transformation in the system. If we can also help our older traditional male colleagues and our, our managers who sit up the track to reward different kinds of excellence, and I think we're starting Starting to see that trend, which will then feed through to the educational pipeline too. Thank you. And there is the last uh, question for, for you, Dr. Mandel. Uh, it is if you, if uh, do you have active politics to recruit women to study science? Yeah, so we, we don't have positive discrimination in the sense that we go and we, we choose a woman, um, but what we do have is. Um, you know, initiatives to reach out to women and minorities to make sure that we have a widening participation strategy. So for undergraduates, I think all universities now have a widening participation unit because as we know, the pipeline starts early on. So it's bringing students along to let them know how to access the system, how to apply to university, how to actually just interrogate the system and know how to navigate it. Um, and we've got a number of initiatives where we're now looking at the very detail, for example, of the language that we use in our job adverts to recruit. So there are many 
lovely online tools where you can just cut and paste the text of your job advert, your recruitment advert, you can put it in and it will tell you um, the degree of gender bias. And that might be you have, you know, maybe very um, women dominated professional services and you may want to change the language as well. So you can flip it either way. So really practical things like that. Internationally within my field, we have the, the American Astronomical Society has a women's network. And I've always made sure that when I've been recruiting to my group that I advertise on that network because as we've said before, it's about that tap on the shoulder. It's about saying, I'm speaking to you so that if you get the applications in, the women will then naturally come through that process because you've reached all of the talent. And that's how I've got 50-50 in my group, not because I've gone and you know positively discriminated towards women, but because I've opened that pipeline and made everybody know I'm talking to you. If you apply, you will now then be um, assessed and the best people will come through. Because I think just to finish, you know, the most important thing for young women to know is that they're not being picked because they're women, they're being enabled because they're excellent. And I want the best people in my team. I don't want half of the people in my team to be excellent and everybody to be the same. I want the best people. And I want those people to come to my team and know that they've been picked on merit. But all of the bias below in the system is what knocks out that merit. And so when we get a monoculture, the people who've arrived through privilege think they've got through merit and they haven't, they've come through bias. So it's about removing the baggage, removing the bias, and then you get um, the equality coming out in the outcomes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Franklin, no sé si uh, quiere agregar algo respecto a... Um, and doctor, I don't know if you want to add anything to um, Professor Mandel's comments about active recruitment policies and other initiatives. Well, regarding recruitment, what we have is a recruiting team that is um, focused more on promoting, so career development rather than access to first level employment, because we don't have a problem with first level employment. What we do have is problem in career progression. So we want to work with uh, universities such as engineering schools where we have a project that aims at uh, growing the number of female students in engineering courses. We do have programs and budgets and so on, and we are giving talks and organizing other seminars, but no more than that. Well, thank you very much. I don't think that we can keep going any further. So thank you very much. And thank you for your time and for your incredibly interesting remarks. I'm sure that there's a lot more to say, uh, but I had to say that it's been very inspiring. So thank you very much on behalf of the embassy team. Mr. Ambassador, if you want to say anything, well, it's been incredibly interesting. I just want to say thank you to all of you, Carol, Carolina, Marta, and Anna for your contributions. And as they always tell me in my family, I'm sort of a psychotic activist in a way. So I just want to uh, end today's session in a high note. And I would like to, uh, highlight something that Professor Mandel said, and that is the importance of being aware of our limitations and the limitations that we encounter. And I think that you are very much aware also of your power for transformation. And I think that we are witnessing a revolution that is incredible. Uh, so many things in the world are now coming down, being actually undergoing a collapse in a way. Uh, consumption, rights, access, all of it is changing before our eyes. So it's very interesting to see. Thank you very much. And we are going to continue our conversation and hopefully we'll be able to have uh, a follow-up uh, panel on all these matters. Thank you and happy Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Real pleasure. Bye-bye.